This morning, um, we're going to talk about uh, this phrase called living on mission. And to be honest with you, that phrase falls flat with me. I don't, I don't, really, I don't really get it. I mean, I get it. I know what, as, as somebody who lives in like the church world, I get what, what we mean when we say living on mission. But to be honest with you, it kind of it falls flat with me. It doesn't really inspire me to do anything if that makes sense. There's a story, if you guys are familiar with the author, uh, C.S. Lewis, he wrote a series of books called The Chronicles of Narnia. And uh, if you haven't read the books, like I haven't read the books, you've probably watched the movie, like I've watched the movie, right? Um, And in the first movie, it's called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Um, There is a moment where Lucy, the youngest girl, is uh, watching Aslan, and as movies do, the movie is different than the book, so uh, take it for what you will. But the, the line is still the same. They included it. And she's watching Aslan at the end walk off into the sunset. He's headed off to who knows where, uh, waiting, I guess, for the next thing to happen so he can come back in and save the day. And she's watching him and having a conversation with this other person. And she says, where's he going? And... The guy says, well, he, I don't know, he's, he's on a tame line. And she goes, wait, what? He says, he's on a tame line. And she says, but he's safe, right? And he said, yeah, and he's good. He's safe. He's, uh, I'm sorry, is he safe? I screwed that up. <laughs> Start over. Is he safe? And he says, no, he's not safe, but he is good. He's not safe, but he is good. You're welcome, (laughs) anticlimactic. Crash and burn. That's okay. He's not safe, but he is good. And that's the point of following Jesus. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Today may seem like a little bit of a heavy subject. And usually, if you have been here, you you know that we take verse by verse a lot of times. And we'll break that verse down, and we'll kind of talk through what that means. Today's a little bit more of a topical message, and we're going to talk about this idea of living on mission, right, and what we would call following Jesus. That's what we see in the Bible. What does it mean to follow Jesus? And the fact is, Jesus demands everything. Jesus demands everything when we follow him. And it's easy to think that when we accept Christ, that there's somehow this, like, ticket that's punched, Right, and we're we now have what people refer to as fire insurance, or we're on our way to heaven. Like Jesus, I, I'm good. I got the cross around my neck, and you're good to go. But I don't remember Jesus ever riding a train. He walked, and his followers would follow him step by step, and that's the life of that. That's what it means to live on mission. Whatever Jesus is laying before you to do, whatever he is convicting you to do in your life, that's the thing to do. And it's very overwhelming. I'll be honest with you. When I, when I read the scripture or when I hear a sermon and people are like, yeah, follow Jesus, do all these things, I get very overwhelmed because there's a lot and I don't do a lot of them. Or at least I don't see myself doing some of them at that point. And I'm like, okay, I, I'm doing this, but I'm not doing that. So I need to run over here and do this thing. And I get overwhelmed by what it means to follow Jesus. He demands everything in our lives. And I started to think practically. I've I've been trying to think practically. How can we live on mission? What does it mean to live on mission? And I would just encourage you this. It's about a step-by-step process. If you will, turn your Bibles to Philippians 3.7. Firstly, we need to understand the weight of what Christ demands from us. Philippians 3, starting in verse 7 says this, it says, but whatever gain I had, I counted loss, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for Christ. Paul is the one writing this. Paul is an apostle of Christ. After Jesus ascended, Paul continued his ministry of preaching the gospel. And at the moment of writing this, this book of Philippians, what we call a book, by the way, it's not a book, it's a letter. We're the ones that inserted the verses and chapters. This is a letter to some 
group of people, the church of Philippi, that he's writing to. And he is writing to them from prison. He's literally in the worst case scenario that you can think of. He's writing from prison, and yet the words that he says have no negativity to them. I mean, if I was in prison, I'd be like, hey, can you go raise some money and like get me out of here? That would be great. If you could pray for my release. I mean, I wouldn't even be worrying about other people or honestly, I don't even know how I would glorify Christ in that. I'm not sure I would be strong enough. He says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my, my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish. That word actually means dung or poop. And these accomplishments that he's talking about, these things that he's talking about losing, are status. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was educated. He was an, a very educated man. He had achieved all that he could achieve in his chosen path which is to be a religious leader. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, a Jew of Jews. And and concerned to the law, he was flawless. And yet he says, I count all of those things as lost for the sake of knowing Christ. I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. And as I was reading through this, one of the thoughts I had is, is, first of all, who actually thinks that way? Who in this room would actually say that and mean it? Would you count your career, your, your uh, savings, your finances, all your vehicles, your, your family, everything that you identify in your life as a, success, a point of success, How many of you would actually say, I would count that as loss. I would literally give that up. I would let that turn to rubble for the sake of knowing Christ. And it could be said that, oh, that's a little bit of an overdramatization of what's being said here, but it's not. It's exactly what he's saying. Everything in my life, is way down here. It's, it's, it's literally a pile of dung compared to knowing Christ. And the, the second thought I've had is, do I know Christ in that kind of way? Do I know Christ in a way that I am receiving life and joy from him, that I have a relationship with him that's, that's in a sense, tangible in my life? Is it this true wellspring of life that's flowing out of me? That's what the Bible says, is when when the Spirit comes in, that we have a wellspring of life. There is an experiential side of our, it's supposed to be an experiential side of our relationship with Jesus. It's not just a list of do's and don'ts. It can't be that. There are enough of those out there in any religion you want. But the Bible and Christ, through his word, promises something so much deeper. And so I, actually, I question myself, do I actually love Jesus in a way that I, I enjoy him more than these other things? And that I would pursue him first over these things. I would give them up just to know Christ. And to be honest with you, there are times that I say no to that kind of relationship. I'm learning to say yes more. I'm learning the value of saying yes when Jesus asks me to do the hard things, when he calls me to give something up or to step into something. I'm learning the value of being obedient in that, in that as I do, out of love, I receive that sense of love and life from Jesus. If I'm not just doing it out of a guilty conscience or a check, I'm, I'm right, I'm doing the right things. But doing it because I know that this person, this man, Jesus Christ, said to do it. I'm doing it out of obedience for him. There is a life that comes. And this is a very simple teaching, guys. But this is what I feel. And this is where we're headed. You know, um, over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about this. You're going to hear this phrase a lot about living on mission. 
And what I want us to start out is this foundation of asking, why would we even live on mission? Why would we even say we want to live on mission? And the purpose, the reason, the answer to that question has to be because I love Jesus. Because I have a relationship with him. Because I followed this man named Jesus. I don't just read the book. I don't just come to church. But I actually have this give and take, this emotional, this tangibility to the relationship of me and Jesus. And I want to encourage you guys, if that's not where you're living, if that's not your experience, it is possible. It is possible. God is invisible. Yes, it's true. But he's also tangible. It's weird. It's weird how that happens. It is possible. <clears throat> As Christ followers, our life is to be in constant process of being conformed to his. This is the calling, that we are in this constant process, that, that God is putting pressure on some things and saying, give that up, and he is leading us in other ways and saying, step into this. this is, it is a life of constant process. But I think the truth of the matter is, a lot of times we want Jesus to come into our life, and then we expect nothing to change. We think because he's invisible, all of the things that are in place in our life aren't going to shift. But if you followed Christ for any amount of time, you know that when he comes in, something in your life will immediately be uncomfortable and need to move around. You will be called to lay down this sin you weren't really even aware was a sin. You will be called to step into some kind of ministry, whether it's just having a conversation with somebody or stepping out of something and into something else, transition, right? God will put pressure on things in your life because when he comes in, things move around. So what I would ask you this morning, you can write this down. This is a good, this will be just a good reflective uh, question. And I would say pray through this. Um, you don't have to answer all this right now. Sometimes it's hard to hear the Lord whenever you've got this guy up here speaking in your ear. So this would be something to pray, th pray through. How is my life being rearranged and, re and repurposed for the purposes of Jesus? How is your life being rearranged and repurposed for the purposes of Jesus? <coughs> Excuse me. Because the fact of the matter is this. When we are saved, there is a citizenship change. And it's not just a name change. It would be easy if it was just a name change. But it's a literal citizenship change. And I started thinking, like, well, what if I, as an American, right, what if I was immediately just, bam, like that, transported to India or Africa or someplace I've never lived. I've never used their currency. I don't know their language. I don't know their social appropriations. I don't know anything. I don't know how to fit in or blend in. This is the, the same thing that happens and should happen as Christ followers. We are immediately transported, so to speak, into a new citizenship. There is a new calling that we need to learn the language of the scripture. We need to learn what God's currency is. We need to learn what God values. What are his appropriations for our life? And it takes time. And there's an uncomfortableness to it. I, I went to France one time <clears throat> and... Uh, it was not good, y'all. I'm glad there were other people there with me because I didn't even know how to order food. And you would think you could just like point, but they're like, I don't know what your point is. You literally have to walk up to the menu and be like, this one, that one right there. And it was very awkward. <clears throat> you can write this down. We cannot escape the uncomfortable nature of being conformed to be like Jesus. If you're going to be a Christ follower, there's going to be those uncomfortable times of being conformed to his nature. The Bible talks about us being, uh, us being the clay, him being the potter. There's this uh, analogy given in scripture that we will be formed 
by Jesus. And we cannot escape the uncomfortable nature of that formation in our life. <clears throat> so living on mission. If you're taking notes, the main point is this. Following Jesus is not one decisive moment, but step by step. To live on mission, if you really want to live that out, if you want, uh, if you want to do that, it's not one decisive moment. It is a step-by-step -step process of obedience. Matthew 16, 24 through 26 says this. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Anyone who's walked with Jesus knows that this is not just a decision to be made one time. Every day, I have to choose to deny myself. It's a daily thing to wake up and say, you know what? I don't feel like it, but I'm going to love my spouse in this way. I'm going to serve her. I'm going to treat my kids better because Jesus demands it of me. I'm going to work hard at work like I love it. Because the Bible says, whatever you find, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your heart. Step by step, day by day, the world, stop it. Yeah, I don't know why y'all went there. Why did y'all go there? Okay, now I can't use that phrase step by step. <clears throat> Many times we ask Jesus in and we're shocked and frustrated by the changes that he requires. So to live on mission means this. It means we're to pursue holiness and morality in our lives. It means that we give up things like drunkenness. We give up things like sexual sins it means our love for money has to go away Jesus says that the love of money is the root of all evil all evil sprouts out of this love for money and that can't be overstated and somehow we understate it in our life I've done it maybe you don't but I have done it I have loved money and there are times I find myself still loving money and I want to pursue it. <clears throat> but he says our love for money has to go away because you can't love money and love God is what he says. Pride. Our pride has to go away. We are to live a life of humility. Not pride that we are better than others. Haughtiness has to go away. Our self-centeredness, our selfishness, our desire to serve self first, please self, entertain self, me, 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 I, 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 that has to go away. Anger, it's a big one for me, has to go away. I can't glorify God when I'm angry. Unforgiveness, unforgiveness has to go away. Jesus said, unless you forgive, I can't forgive. And I think he probably said that with a little bit of sadness. Indignation and probably mixed with sadness. If you don't forgive, I can't forgive you. And somehow we hold on to these bitternesses, these roots of poison in our life. And we choose to say, but that person did that. I can't forgive that. And Jesus says, you have to forgive that. Sometimes we are called to forego our own dreams and desires and passions and the things that we want to pursue in life, the things that bring us joy, the things that make us feel fulfilled as a person. God calls us sometimes to lay those things down so that we can do something else, so that our time can be dedicated to do something else. Sometimes living on mission means he calls us to give away our money. This is a hard one for me, guys. I struggle with this one. 
And if I'm honest, only recently in my life have I begun to be actually, I feel like, obedient, fully obedient in this area. It's difficult, especially when you don't make a lot of it, right? Can I get an amen? Maybe a hallelujah. But he calls us to be generous. He calls us to open the doors of our homes to have meals with people that otherwise we wouldn't have anything to do with. I'm not going to lie, most of y'all wouldn't hang out with if it wasn't for Jesus. I, I would just be, I'd be fine being by myself and with my family. I don't need anybody in this room if it was me. But Jesus comes and he says, look, you can't really have life unless you're a part of a community. You can't really flourish as a human being unless you enter the awkwardness of community. And so the love of Christ compels me to hang out with you guys. And it's not that I don't like you. Please don't, don't put words in my mouth. But, <laughs> but honestly, I wouldn't invest time in other people unless it was Christ that compelled me to do so. And this is the calling. Open my, the doors to my home. Have meals with people. It means that we open our mouths and speak and we testify and we look for opportunities as we engage people throughout the day to inject some sort of God's truth into, into the lives of other people. That we bring Christ into the conversation. We're not looking for Christ to just show up there. We bring him into the conversation. And we look for ways to, in a Christ-centered way, encourage people. Not just like, oh, you'll be okay, you can do it. But like, hey man, I'm, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. Things like that, that's just simple, where you're bringing Christ as a solution for these people. <clears throat> You'll be surprised at how much more conversation will be opened up the moment that you open that door. It means that we are to visit the orphans and the widows. I include this one because this was a very specific command. The Bible teaches that pure and undefiled religion is someone who visits the widows and orphans and we could go into a teaching of why I think that he used this specific example but if we just take it at face value and say we need to take care of the widows and orphans I gotta tell you there's an F on my paper I just, I just don't do it yeah I take care of the widows in my life I love those people that are next to me and in my circle. But do I go out of the way to help orphans in our community? It's a very big problem. And they need people to come alongside them and, and to father them, to be a friend to them. And so I include that one <clears throat> because it was very specific. And somehow I have acted like it's okay not to do that. Like it's not, like it's okay for me to not give my money to help orphans, to, to, to look at them as dispensable from a time standpoint. Does that make sense? These are very specific things that Christ says calls each Christian to do. We're not talking about like go and be a full-time missionary. We're not even talking about that yet. We're just talking about the universal demands that Jesus makes upon our life that every Christ follower can live out. Does that make sense? And I would just ask you, what is the divide between the, the commands that we see in Scripture and what's manifesting in your life? What things are left out? What, what are the commands that are left out from being manifested in, in your life that you can take action on right now? There's a, I love the Batman trilogy series by Christopher Nolan. I don't know if anybody is on that train with me, but I love Batman. Um, and there's a line in the movie where she tells Bruce, it's not who you are underneath that defines you. It's what you do that defines you. And I just love that line. I'm like, yeah, go get him, Bruce. Let's go, baby. And I thought about that, and it is applicable to the Christian life, but it's also not complete. 
what we see in Scripture is much more, um, it's much bigger and encompasses much more than that. And I would say if we were, if we were to say that to each other, our version of that would be who you are underneath will be displayed by what you do and how you live. Because it takes both. It takes being a person of courage, being a person of, of uh, in pursuit of righteousness and holiness, and then living that out. It takes both. Our lives must mirror the life we see in Jesus. These are some very practical ways, again, like that, that are universally placed upon the body of Christ to pursue holiness, to be generous, to be hospitable, to, to preach the word of God. Not just, not just in an official capacity like this, but to open our mouths, to pray for people, and to expect Jesus, to bring Jesus into those conversations and interactions that we have. These are the universal calling of what it looks like to live on mission. <clears throat> and then there's another aspect that I started to think about, um, because again, I'm trying to be very practical in what it means to follow Jesus. And I was having a conversation with a, with a friend of mine this week, talking to him about this stuff, and he brought up a, a very interesting concept. He said, could it be that the pathway to your mission is right through the pain point in your life? Could it be that the pathway to your mission leads right through the thing, that pain point in your life? And at first I was like, well, that sounds like a really good thought, but you're going to have to explain that one to me. But the point is, in this land of luxury that we live in, we spend most of our time running from pain. We spend most of our time running from risk and eliminating risk. Eliminating pain. We have painkillers. we got the entertainment to distract us when we're overburdened, overworked, overstressed. We have all of the things to try to get rid of, mitigate, no, uh, dull, void the pain in our life. Distract us from those things that are bringing us pain. But the reality is this, that is, if Paul suffered, if Jesus suffered, we can expect suffering as well. It's just the fact of the matter. And we're so geared to run from and avoid suffering but when Paul was in prison, he said, this is for the advancement of the gospel. This is actually an opportunity. Somehow, this uh, prison that I'm in, this place of captivity, is actually to advance the gospel. And I would challenge you to rethink those areas of your life that bring you pain, bring you distress, bring you stress and turmoil or fear or anxiety. And I would challenge you to look at that and go, is there something God is trying to do through that? Is there something that can glorify God in this area? Because the Bible says that our, uh, oh, what is the, I forgot it right now. Our momentary struggles, our momentary affliction, that's what it is. Our momentary affliction is bringing about an eternal weight of glory. Our momentary affliction, whatever that be, is bringing about an eternal weight of glory in Christ Jesus. There will be a reward. There will be a relief. <clears throat> and so when we think about this phrase, this idea of maybe our mission, maybe your mission today is actually the pathway to living on mission for you, maybe that looks like going through this point of pain in your life. I know a lady shall remain nameless <clears throat> I know a lady who um, her mother-in-law uh, was getting older in years and her children were not taking care of her um, she didn't have primary responsibility to care for her mother-in-law there were plenty of other people to do this. And yet, because of their neglect, and out of uh, 
this love that only Jesus can have, was compelled to care for this woman for years. And she changed her diapers, she gave her baths, she changed her sheets, she fed her, she was her um, spokesperson, um, she took up for her. When, they, when she couldn't speak up for herself, this woman came alongside and said, no, this is the way it needs to be done. And she gave up years of her life and things that she could be doing outside of the home uh, with her own family, her own immediate family, her own friends, her own community, whatever that is. She gave that up so that she could care for a widow. And this was not an easy time. It was not an easy thing to do because relationships were messy. It was a very painful point in her life. And yet, being compelled by, by Christ to do the right thing, she took this on herself. And she served joyfully. Not only served, served joyfully. Only Christ can do that. And there was great reward from that. And sometimes, that's what Christ calls us to do. <clears throat> Maybe the job that you feel stuck in right now is the exact atmosphere that Jesus wants to use to grow your character. I've worked jobs that I absolutely despise. And at the end, I go, man, God did something in me that I didn't even know he was trying to do. He changed something in me through that thing. Through my humility in doing something that I didn't even want to be, uh, I didn't want people to associate me with, right? I didn't want to be seen as that. God changed me. God grew my character. <clears throat> Maybe it's in your experience of financial lack right now or financial stress. It's in those moments that God begins to shape our understanding of where our security and where our riches actually are and come from. It's where he begins to question and reveal to us where our dependence is, li is lying and where it's rooted at. Maybe your physical pain or ailment, maybe that's actually something that God can use for his glory. And maybe there's a testimony in how you're walking through that that God is going to use, and you can't see why. The, that's the crazy thing is you're going through these, thumb, these things. A lot of times you can't see what God is doing, but he is doing something. Maybe the situation that was supposed to look one way actually turned out to look another it was supposed to be this great opportunity. And it's turned out to be a little bit frustrating, disappointing. Maybe that's exactly what God is using to conform you, to think like he thinks and to act like he acts. Maybe the painful thing is that God is calling you out of one thing and into another. But he hasn't shown you what's next. He's just asking you to step out of the thing. That's hard. And maybe it's that uncomfortable time that God is using to draw you closer and say, I want to speak with you. I want this relationship. Because he wants us to learn what it looks like to live by faith, not by sight. And the only way we can do that is by removing our vision. We, we say we want to live by faith and not by sight. But the moment that God puts something over our eyes and says, okay, follow me. We're like, wait, no, are you kidding? We expect Jesus to enter our life and nothing move. But God will shake every foundation. God will shake every precept that you have thought to be true. So maybe, just maybe the pathway to your mission is through the pain. Maybe that's what living on mission looks like for you. And I want to give you a couple prayers that you can pray. Simple prayers that I've found helpful for me. And really, these were just pleas of my heart. Um, 
One of them is this. What are you trying to teach me? Lord, what are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to show me? What are you trying to get across? What are you building? Another one is this. Finish what you started. Finish it. And I even added in there, when I would pray, when I pray these things, I I ask the Lord, finish it quickly. Like, let's get this done. I want to get through this and over this. Because I don't like pain. I don't like suffering. I don't like not knowing where I'm going. I don't like anxiousness. And so I would encourage you to pray these things. Finish what you've started quickly. Um, You guys can come up and um, prepare for a response song. My encouragement to you this morning, because we've gone through a lot of things. And again, I don't want you to walk away feeling overwhelmed. Because the calling is great. Jesus, Jesus taught some hard things. He said, anyone who would put their hand to the plow and look back is not worthy to follow me. That's a hard teaching because I find myself looking back a lot. But anyone who would follow me must deny himself, take up his cross, put his hand to the plow, look forward, look at me, and follow me. That's the message of the gospel, and that's the Jesus we serve. He's not an easy Jesus. He's not safe. But he is good. And he is king. We need to know that. He is king and worthy of our, our allegiance. There's no one greater. You're not greater, even if you wish you were. Even if I wish I was, I'm not. And so I'm forced to humble myself in front of this person who came to the earth, suffered and died, was ripped apart, made human rubble for me, and was raised to life. This is the powerful man of Jesus. And this is the God that we serve. And it's the man who calls us to follow him, knowing that everything in our life will be shaken. The rich young ruler came to Jesus and he said, he said, Jesus, I want to follow you. Jesus was getting fame at this point. He was getting to be known. He said, Jesus, I want to follow you. Tell me how to follow you. And Jesus knew the thing that he had his identity wrapped up in him. So he went for that. Jesus, don't play around, guys. He said, go sell everything that you own and give your money to the poor. He didn't say, go give all your things to the poor because he knew that this guy's identity wasn't wrapped up in things. It was wrapped up in money. So he said, sell all that stuff, get the very thing that you love and pursue and is your God. Give that away. Because he says you can't serve money and God at the same time. And so the point is this. There are a lot of things that Jesus requires of us. But I would just ask you, what's next for you? What is that thing? What is that place in your life, that sin in your life that he's calling you to give up? What is that step of obedience that you've refused to take? What is that point of pain that you've hated and rejected and not wanting to deal with or or walk through. And God says, no, walk through that. It's going to be good. What is the next step for you? That's all you need to ask. And if you wake up every day saying, Lord, I want to follow you. I'm weak, but I'm strong in your spirit. Just reveal to me what's next. And I want to go after that thing. I want to work with you. It becomes very simple then. You don't have to try to do everything all at once, but you do have to do the one thing that he calls you to do. And when you take that step, he'll give you another step. And you'll be stronger to take that one. He gives you another step, take that one. You'll be stronger to take the next one. Your 
a work in progress. And I just want to encourage you, take that next step. It's worth it. And the moment we, the moment we reject the next step and we say, I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do that. Disobedience is a pause button in your life. And you'll see things put on pause. You'll see your relationships start to suffer. Not only with Christ, you'll see your relationships with people start to suffer. And you'll begin to wonder why things aren't moving in your life. A lot of it's because we're not taking the next step. Not always. Sometimes God works in different ways. But a lot of times we can be found in a place of what feels like Paul's. Because God is doing something. and He's asking us to work with him and we've refused. So I just want to encourage you. I um, heard a story one time. A guy was saying, uh, man, I love to go hear that preacher preach, man. But I always walk away and I'm just like, what does he want me to do? Preaches good messages, but what's he want me to do? You don't need to ask me what to do. Just, just ask Jesus. I know that sounds cheesy. But if you believe he's real, then that question, then, then that's not cheesy. And I just want to take a moment here as these guys play and sing. And um, the song's called Build My Life. What a perfect prayer to say, I want to build my life on you. I want to build my life around you. Um, ask that question, Lord, what, what is it? You may already know. You probably already know. You probably already feel it. Um, pray for strength. Pray that God would show you what he's trying to show you, that you'd be able to understand it. And pray that God would finish what he started. Because God always makes something beautiful. God always makes something beautiful. I love you guys. Let's pray.